And before we start with our new topic this afternoon, let's just have a quick scan through, go through again what we have discussed last meeting. So we have discussed uh, the definition of the process itself. So liquid-liquid extraction is a unitary process that involves two liquid phases here. One is the feed and the other one is the solvent. And in the process of the extraction, we produce two equilibrated layers. We have the extract layer and the raffinate layer. So we have discussed that. And we also covered its special application. So it could be used in the removal of contaminants, in the recovery of desired components. So whatever that may be, it can be used uh, as an alternative to distillation because distillation is really uh, uh, very costly. So solvent extraction or liquid-liquid extraction, as long as recovery of the solvent can be facilitated is another option. Okay, now we have defined the terms, the feed. So in the feed, we have our carrier solvent and the solute. Now we've discussed that the solute is the minor component in the feed. So the rest there would be your carrier solvent. Then we've discussed terms like the separating agent. So the one that is responsible for the separation. And uh, the main component in this separating agent is actually the extractant which is, of course, dissolved in the liquid diluent. Now, a modifier from time to time can be added to improve the uh, effectiveness of our extractant. Then we have also here the concept of the theoretical or equilibrium stage applicable. Then we have discussed the extraction factor and the separate separation factor which is similar to the volatility in distillation so it tells you whether separation is possible or not and by the way in each of the slides you could see the section in your handbook where this particular terms could also be found now we've also discussed the partition ratio the distribution coefficient also known as the distribution constant k Okay, we have defined that the loading capacity and solute selectivity as to the solvent properties, mutual solubility, stability, viscosity, recoverability, which is very important. The solvent has to be recovered. Uh, the needed density difference between our feed and our solvent phases, that way a separation would be possible. Now we need to consider also safety. As to the range of the interfacial tension between our feed and solvent phases, that should be between 5 and 25, no less, no more. And we also need to look into industrial hygiene. And in the case of uh, processes that needs to be performed in the western part of the globe, so there is this need for uh, considering whether the solvents will be freezed at the a uh, particular environment where it is placed into. And as such, the towing of such frozen solvent need to be considered. Then, very important in terms of econom economy, so our solvent should be uh, able not only as much as possible, could also be used for other purposes. In terms of sustainability and the protection of the environment, so we need also to consider the uh, adherence to government uh, standards regarding influence uh, of our process, especially this one, uh, which should be in terms of the content which should be within the standards. Then the material of construction of our equipment and the availability and the cost of the said solvent as well. Okay, now as to equilibrium relationships, so in here we have three components to look into. Uh, these three components are present in our bulk phase. So in our bulk phase, and as such, in terms of uh, mass fraction, because this is extraction, so we're not uh, using mole fraction as uh, the usual thing that we use in the other unitary processes. So in here, in terms of mass fraction, in the bulk phase, the sum of the mass fractions of each of the components has to be equal to 1. Okay, so X is used as a representation of the weight percent or the mass percent 
of each of the components in the liquid or in that cell. Since we're talking about liquid phases here, our feed is liquid, our solvent is liquid, so X here is the mole fraction of our feed. And we use Y for the mole, uh, no, the mass fraction rather. So here I go. I also made the mistake. Mass fraction of the feed and the raffinate is X. Mass fraction or mass percentage of the solvent and the extract would be Y. Okay, Y for extract and the solvent, X for the feed and the raffinate. Okay, now we've discussed also how to be able to tell the corresponding composition of your bulk phase or a particular mixture using the triangular diagram. So we have discussed that. And the triangular diagram for partiable, uh, partially miscible components would be something like this, separating the one phase region here from the two phase region. We have the plate point. So the plate in here in the plate point, we expect that there won't be any separation anymore. Okay, and then these are what we call as the equilibrium tie lines. Excuse me. So you have here. Um, a table that could be used just in case this one is not uh, given or you're not given this particular pair of equilibrium data. You have a rectangular uh, diagram together with a triangular diagram on top. So they actually come in pair. And if you're not given this, we can make this as what we have discussed using the values that are seen here in the table. So the last columns, the last two columns are utilized in the rectangular diagram here. And the first and the second column for the second columns for the upper triangular diagram. So if you use those values, what you're going to come up with are the curves that you could see in here. Okay, this 45 degree line uh, is just a 45 degree line that you draw yourself. Just in case this one is not given and you are given in lieu of that a table. Okay, so you have to make one from the table. Okay, and our equilibrium data is specific for our system. So a different system will require a different equilibrium data. Now we have discussed the sample problems. Uh, one and two, uh, and before discussing sample problems one and two, I have briefly discussed the inverse lever arm rule, which is an alternative way of determining compositions and even amounts of phases using the uh, coordinates of the points that were plotted in the triangular diagram. So you have here the L, representing the feed, the V representing the solvent, M is the bulk phase, okay? So you have that. And then uh, we have this sample problem, which is a continuation of sample problem number one. Now, they are connected in the sense that your sample problem number one is asking actually for the compositions of the equilibrated layers, raffinate and extract layers. Now, the sample, the second sample problem is asking for the amounts of these layers. So, V for the extract and L for the raffinate. Okay? Now, we will continue with sample problem number three if you don't have any questions. But before that, I'll discuss first the very important uh, material balance equation or yes, equations for single stage liquid liquid extraction. So far, do you have any questions as what we have covered last meeting? Okay, so there's none, so we will continue. Now, if you have a single stage liquid liquid extraction, the process of making the overall mass balance is actually similar to the other unitary processes when you make uh, mass balance or mole balance. In here, we just take the sum of the, two, of the masses of the uh, phases that entered our equipment and the same would be equated to the sum 
of the masses of the faces that leaves our equipment. So in our representation here, we're using GN2 please representation. We're in the, the streams leaving a particular stage, and this is our single stage extraction unit, are said to be equilibrated. So V1 and L1 are said to be equilibrated here. And we take the sum of these two, L1 and V1, equated with the sum of L0 and V2. And that would be equivalent to the mass of the bulk phase. The bulk phase consisting of the phases that were intimately contacted. And that's where your interface is actually reduced. Now, if you make a component balance on the solute A, it's patterned after the overall material balance. You just use X for the liquid uh, feed and raffinate. Uh, X for the mass percentage of the two, and you use Y for the solvent, solvent YA2, and for the extract YA1. Your bulk phase M still uses the X representation for its uh, mass percent or mass fraction of solute A. Now, for C, you just change the A's. You just base it on C. Okay, so your Component balance equation is patterned after your mass balance equation and you just multiply the phases with the corresponding concentrations, mass concentration. Now, uh, in our uh, text, you could see uh, if, if you have time to scan through what uh, the text that you have with you, either Gian Kuklis or McCabe, uh, you have this triangular diagram where the LO and the V2 are plotted. So LO is actually your, <coughs> excuse me, your feed and V2 is your solvent. So your LO most of the time is plotted on the horizontal axis since it does not contain any C. So you see your C here is the composition, the mass percentage of the uh, solvent. The C. Now the B is most of the time water, as we have discussed, and A is your solute, whatever that may be. So your feed being uh, not containing C, so it's most of the time right on the horizontal axis. You just get its uh, XAO and you place it right on the horizontal X axis. As for our solvent, most of the time also it's 100% our solvent. So that is why you see it right here on the apex of the triangle. We connect these two and the bulk phase M in here should be the uh, sum of these two phases or should constitute these two phases, the feed and the extract. From this bulk phase M, we will, uh, you can construct using graphical representation, you can construct the tie line wherein you will be able to make the uh, or determine the composition of the raffinate. So this is your raffinate, the L1. As discussed last meeting, our raffinate is written always at the bottom part of our face envelope. And our V1, our extract, is written on the upper part of the face envelope. If you can recall, uh, there is a corresponding pair of rectangular diagram in here at the bottom. And there's a 45 degree line in here. So how these two came about is, uh, let's say for example, you have this curve here. I'll just approximate the curve that could be seen. So this bulk phase M is a line in which, uh, or is a point in which the tie line uh, L1 and V1 should pass through. So just like the discussion that we had in sample problem number one where it, it is a trial and error thing. If you start with the raffinate in here at the bottom, you just go down. If you can still recall, so this is just another review. You go left and you go up. You go up. So I will just make it coincide class so that we will not do trial and error. So when you go up, this curve here actually ensures that these two phases, your raffinate and your extract phases are equilibrated. This uh, curve here ensures that. 
And since they are equilibrated, when you connect them, for this to be the exact location of the raffinate and the extract layers, meaning you're just going to read here the compositions, uh, here for the C, here for the A, same thing with the raffinate. When they are connected, they should pass through the bulk phase M, the point M. If not, if they're not going to pass through this bulk phase M, then this is not the equilibrium tie line that should be produced. If you're fed with having this particular composition and your solvent also having this particular composition is intimately mixed, that way, uh, after equilibrated, you'll be able to separate your extract from the raffinate with the extract already containing, if not 100% of the solute of the feed, but the solute in the feed. So it's not shown in here, however, but this tie line that is constructed here passing through M is determined or is drawn using the process discussed in sample problem number one. Okay, it's, uh, it's sample problem number one. If you, if you have time, you go back to that particular sample problem and look into the process of determining the tie line. Okay, now if you will ask this Ali, how are we going to uh, plot M? How are you going to plot M? So if you have done your homework already and if you have checked on what's available in your book, it says there and uh, that your M is right on the line connecting L sub O and B sub 2. So this is more on the graphical approach. And whatever is the computed, okay, calculated, computed uh, composition of your bulk phase in terms of C. So if you use C, for demand. If you use A, for demand. So if you use C, you look for that value in here and then project it horizontally until you reach the line connecting L sub O and B sub 2. If you use A, the same process, you look for that value of A here on the horizontal axis, project it up vertically until you reach this point M here. So it's going to rest, it's going to stop, the projection is going to stop or rest right on the line connecting L sub O and B sub 2. Okay, now with that M, you can do the trial and error process of determining the L1 and the V1. The very important requirement that should be met is that this L1 and V1, when connected, should pass through the point M, the bulk, uh, the bulk phase M. Okay? Any question so far? So no question. We will continue then if there are no questions, okay? So we'll have, I think, a sample problem here that will illustrate the use of our uh, equilibrium diagram, the pair that is, okay? You're given here a feed mixture. Uh, by the way, class, uh, before I read this particular problem, you have similar sample problems in Janku, please, the no, with the ones that I'm giving here. So the ones I'm giving here in the slides, if not mistaken, is taken from the chapter and problems. But in terms of pattern and principle, they are similar to what we have with the sample problems of Janku, please. So I'm, I'm looking for a similar problem. That way I will not miss uh, pointing out the very necessary fundamental principles to you. Now, so I'll go back to the problem. So I've given here a feed mixture weighing 200 kilograms of a known composition. Now, it has a known composition, but we know that it contains water, acetic acid, and isopropyl ether. And it is contacted in a single stage with 280 kilograms of a mixture containing 40 weight percent acetic acid, 10 weight percent water, and 50 weight percent isopropyl ether. This time, the composition of the solvent is known and its amount. Now, the resulting raffinate layer weighs 320 kilograms and contains 29.5 weight percent acetic acid, 66.5 weight percent water, and 4% weight percent isopropyl ether. Now, you're given one of the two equilibrated layers, and that's the raffinate layer, 
and with its amount and composition. In here, you are to determine the original composition of the feed mixture and the composition of the resulting extract layer. Okay? The composition of the feed, which is a known, and the resulting composition of the extract layer. Now, for us to be able to solve this problem, uh, let's go to our jam board and write down the information that we're given. So, you may take a screenshot of the problem now. That way, you can supply me with the information that is needed when we go to uh, outlining the process of determining the unknowns. Okay, so I'll now share our jump board. Okay, uh, can you see the jump board? Uh, just give me a reaction if you can see the jump board. Okay, thank you. So this is our sample problem number three already. Now we we'll write the given. So we will represent our single stage liquid-liquid uh, extraction here by a box. And since it's just, have, uh, it's just consisting of a single stage unit, so we we'll label it as one. And we will represent our streams the way it's represented by Gentiles. So we have LO for our feed and we have L1 for our raffinet. So what's the value of our raffinet? 320 kilograms. So we have 320 kilograms for the raffinate. Can you give me the uh, composition of the solute and just the solvent? Uh, water, you need, not, you need not give me the composition of water. What is XA1, XC1? 295, miss. 0. 0.295. 0. 0.04. And 0. 0.04. Okay. Now, our feed, as mentioned in the problem, is? 200. 200. Okay. I'd like the others also to participate. So, we have here our solvent. We'll label it as V sub 2. And our extract, we label it as V sub 1. So, in terms of our solvent, how much of the solvent are we given to use? 280 ms. Okay, 280 kilograms. And of course, we'll just need here the A and the C. Okay, so that would be YA2. Why? I'm oh, sorry. Why did I place uh, C here? It should be 2. YA2 and YC2. Okay, can you give me the compositions of A and C? Your solute yes. the solvent is? YA2 means 0. 0.40. Okay, 40%. Okay, YC2 is? 50 means 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5. Okay, thank you for that. That's it. Okay. Uh, these are the given information in our problem. Uh, we required we are required to find the composition of the extract, right? The composition of the extract. So if it's labeled here, this would be YA1, YC1. So we need YA1 and YC1. What else? The composition of the so the composition of the extract is unknown and the composition of the feed. So the problem is asking also the composition of the feed. Uh, so we'll have only initially XAO and XCO. So we need the compositions of the feed and the extract given the information here. Any questions? So far as to what is placed in on the given and the required information. 
Okay, there's none. So let's go to our solution. Now, I already pasted here our uh, diagram for this particular problem. And this is for the system uh, acetic acid, water, and isopropyl ether. The same as that one uh, in the problem. Okay? The reason I place it in here is because, if you notice, we need to find the composition of the extract. For us to be able to find the composition of the extract, we need the location of the raffinate. Okay, the location of the raffinate. Specifically, uh, we need the A, or it could be also the C, but most of the time we use the A, the solute con uh, content of our raffinate. So that would be the 0.295. Now, what would I do with it? So in the equilibrium diagram here, so you have on the upper part, the triangular diagram, you have 0.5. So this must be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. And this is the A and this is the C. Okay, so in our case, you are to find the 0.295. So it's very near 0.3. So I look for that point in here and this is the one that we're looking for. Okay, see that? More or less 0.295. This is our L1. Okay. Now we need to find the location of our extract. So this is class A problem that is uh, that cannot be solved wholly 100% analytical. You are to refer to the equilibrium diagrams. In this case, this is where it's going to be used. So what you'll do here in your raffinate, just like an example, problem number one, you go down, you go down on the rectangular diagram that you have, you stop on the equilibrium curve, then you turn left, okay, then once you stop when you reach the line, then you go up. We go up and project this same point on the upper part of the face envelope. So I'm going just to give you an approximation of this particular value based on the reading that I have on the actual equilibrium diagram. Now this is the location of the extract, the V sub 1. And if you're going to connect this B1 and L1, I'm going to use a different color. What you, what you are forming is the tie line. The tie line connects the two equilibrated strings. So you see that? So this is our tie line already. But what we need for our problem is the composition of the extra. So this is the composition of our extra. So this is for the YC1. Why? Because this is C and this is for YA1. Whatever this value here. Okay? Now more or less, more or less, uh, these are the values of the two. So I'll place here from Equilibrium diagram. These are the compositions that more or less you'll be getting. For your YA1, uh, more or less, it has a value of 0.225. And for YC1, it has a value of 0.885. This one in terms of C and this one in terms of A. Now, this is actually, this set of values already gives you the composition of the extract, the first requirement here. Now, you can add that of water, YB1, which is just 1 minus the sum of these two. So, uh, based on my approximation here, you could see that this is already beyond one, right? So then I made a mistake. So this must be 0.125, not 
here. Because this one is 0 0.1, so 0 0.125 only. If I have 0 0.125 added to 0 0.885, this would be 10. This would be more than 1 also. So then I have already, you, you will more or less know class based on your reading whether your approximation is acceptable or not. Because the sum of the three components should be equal to 1. So in my case, based on my reading here, it's 0.885. It could not be. Because if I will add the 2, it will be over 1. So it could not be. So probably if this is... Uh, 0.5, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8, 0.8, 0.9, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14, 0.15, 0.16, 0.17, 0.18, 0.19, 0.20, 0.21, 0.22, 0.23, 
Uh, that would be 1012. Now you do the same thing with C. So this time you use C. So L O X C O B2 Y C2 B1 Y C1 plus L1 X C1. Then 200 X C O plus B2, which is 280, YC2, which is 0.5, B1, which is 160, our C is 0.865. So you have here 0.865. Your L1, which is 320, with a C, which is 0.04. So you'll be able to solve for X, C. Okay. So X, C, O is 0 0.056. 0 0.056. Okay. Take it. So since you already have the C and the A, so X, C, O, X, A, O. So I'll copy the two. Point zero five six, And you have 0 0.012. So you add the two and subtract it from one. The sum from one and that would be the water content of your food. Our XBO is 0.932. Okay, so we have answered already the required information in the problem. Compositions of the extract and the feed. And your feed because it's not given. So... The problem cannot be solved if you haven't learned how to use this equilibrium diagram and the concept of the equilibrium tie line in establishing the location of the extract layer. So using the raffinate, so make sure that your raffinate is right on the lower part of the face envelope, right on the face envelope. You just follow the procedure of establishing the tie line by using the equilibrium curve at the bottom of the triangular curve. Okay, any question here? So no question here? So let's go back to our slides and continue where we ended. Can you see the screen class for problem number three projected? Yes, yes. Okay, so let me know if it's not the uh, it's not on slideshow. So we will continue on the types of equipment. So the types of uh, liquid liquid extraction equipment. So as we go through each of these equipments, this is where. I'm going to inject or this uh, outline, discuss to you how the or how will you apply the specific design consideration in designing that particular equipment. So a different equipment will require a different design consideration or will require a different set of formulas associated with its design. So we'll just discuss each and then uh, determine the required design equations for it. So the simplest type of all uh, extraction uh, processes is the mixer settler type of uh, 
extraction equipment. So in letter A, you could see class that your mixer is separated from the settler. The settler or it could also be viewed as the separator already. So in here in your mixer, your feed is mixed intimately with the solvent. Oftentimes, our solvent is really solvent is really organic in nature. Then the homogenized mixture of the two is fed on the settler, where the separation of the two layers occurs. So the extract separates from the raffinate after the formation of the interface, uh, where your real mass transfer occurs. So it's in the interface where the solute from the feed transfers to the solvent and the two now constitutes the extract layer okay another mixer setter extraction equipment is the mod this is the modified one <clears throat> the settler and the mixer is not separated so there's a continuous feeding here of your feed and solvent they are mixed intimately homogenized then they are just separated in this part of your equipment so this is your this part here constitutes the set the separator the extract is living on top the raffinate is withdrawn at the bottom okay so these uh, are the simplest form of separation equipment those simplest they can also be connected and form into a system, a battery of mixer settlers for uh, multi-stage uh, liquid-liquid extraction. So they could be at, at, uh, arranged one after another to constitute what we call a multi-stage extraction system. But the oftentimes class, this multi-stage extraction system equipments are in the form of towers also. Just like gas absorption towers, sleeping towers. So they are in the form of uh, one cylindrical long uh, tank wherein you have stages there, either uh, based on the height of the packing materials, if it's a pack tower, or uh, you have trays also. So trays are also being used in liquid-liquid um, extraction. Okay, so but these two are the simplest form. Now, this one is a modified version of the mixer settler extraction equipment. Now, aside from the ordinary settler that you have here, which separates the extract and the raffinate layers, you have here baffles, coalescence plates. So you have here a baffle. By the way, this is the baffle. Now, it guides, of course, the flow of the homogenized feed and uh, Sorry, the feed and the solvent, the light phase and the heavy phase. And uh, this baffle uh, guides the flow of this particular homogenized mixture. And you have the construction here of coalescence plates. So from the term coalescence plate, plates, uh, as much as possible, class, we don't want the droplets to coalesce. We want in uh, the area the interfacial area or the surface area for mass transfer to be as much as possible uh, large. And if uh, droplets or, yes, droplets coalis, they group together, this particular surface area is reduced. So uh, that is being addressed by these coalescence plates. That way there won't be any liquid droplets that would be uh, coalescing. So they will remain separated from each other that way we'll have effective mass transfer now after this uh this coalescence plates the solute transferred to your uh, droplets of solvents adhering to the droplets of the solvent will now be separated from your uh, raffinate phase the heavy phase living here and the light phase living on top so this is your extract and this is your raffinate the heavy phase. The heavy phase here is your uh, feed and the blue, the light phase here is your solvent. Uh, these phases are being uh, introduced in the mixing chamber. And later on when equilibrated and extraction already proceeded, they are, the reduced layers are separated. The extract and the raffinate layers are separated. Okay? 
Now, we also have the spray type extraction power. So spray in the sense that uh, in this case class, your heavy liquid, most of the time, the heavy liquid that you're seeing here is your feed. It contains the solute that needs to be transferred to this light liquid, which is your organic solvent. So this light liquid or your organic solvent is being bubbled up, bubbled up, counter current to the heavy liquid that goes down. So uh, in the process, this liquid here, the solvent, uh, takes away the solute from the feed, the heavy liquid, and is, and is removed here at the top of the spray tower as the light liquid or your extract containing the solute taken from the heavy liquid, which is the feed. The heavy liquid here that is removed at the bottom is your raffinate. Okay, so this is your spray extraction tower. Now, if you look into it, it could also be that your feed is sprayed in going downwards. So it's a such spray tower is sprayed in going downwards against the uh, solvent, uh, organic solvent that is being bubbled up against it. So they flow counter current each other. Now, when do we use this type of extraction equipment, the spray uh, extraction tower? So this is used when there is a rapid, irreversible chemical reaction that is expected to happen, uh, such as the neutralization of waste acids. And this spray extraction tower has only one or two stages. So it could not be exceeding two stages. Uh, this is low cost, but it is rarely used. So rarely used because its application is very specific. So when your extraction process entails with it the happening of this rapid irreversible chemical reaction, then this is the tower to use, the spray type extraction tower. Now, as for the packed extraction tower, so this is more efficient than the spray tower. And this is used when only a few stages is needed. And interfacial tension for, between the phases. So if you recall, the interfacial tension should be uh, on the range 5 to 25 dyne per centimeter for extraction to occur. So in here, your interfacial tension is just around 10 dyne per centimeter. Now, the choice of the pat packing material, whether it should be random packing material or structured packing material, is based on the continuous phase. What is this continuous phase? This is the feed. This is the heavy liquid that is introduced into our tower or our column. Now, uses preferably random packing material over structured packing material. Though, again, the choice of the packing material is based on what is the feed, the nature of the feed, oftentimes the random packing material is preferred over the structured packing material. Now, in here, if in gas absorption, we just finished gas absorption, if in gas absorption uh, we use the HETP or the height equivalent to one theoretical uh, plate, one theoretical plate for your pack tower. Uh, in here, we use the HETS, the height equivalent to a theoretical stage. And this one is not anymore solved. This one is taken from a table uh, depending on the type of tower that is being used. And in the case of the height equivalent to a theoretical stage, if your tower is mechanically agitated, then we expect that this HETS will be higher. So it's greater than mechanically agitated towers, this HETS. Okay? We don't use HETP for liquid-liquid extraction pack towers, but we use the HETS. Now, if you recall, this is still fresh, I think, in your memory, the concept of flooding in gas absorption and how it is being used in determining the size of the column. How big is your column in terms of, let's say, its diameter specifically. So in here, we're also using flooding. We determine when our extraction column is flooded 
and we use the computed uh, velocity uh, and then we just used 50 or 60 percent of that computed in here it's 50 50 percent of the computed uh, flooding velocity in designing our column so again when is this flooding or what is flooding in extraction uh, same thing with gas absorption. So, of course, when increasing either uh, of the flow rates of the dispersed or continuous phases, dispersed phase is your solvent phase, continuous phase is your uh, feed, this is your feed, makes both the phases to leave the continuous phase out there. So, instead of your dispersed phase, that is your solvent, leaving the top of the column it will leave the bottom of the column where your continuous space or your feed is also living so if that is the case since both your dispersed and continuous phases is leaving the continuous space outlet your column your equipment is already said to be flooded and we don't want that to happen because there won't be any extraction if your extract will leave the continuous phase out there. So you, you won't be able to separate the solute then. Now it is recommended that the design flow rates be set at 50% of the flooding condition. In gas absorption as based on Jan Kupli's computation, 60% of the flooding velocity is used in determining the size of the column. In here for liquid-liquid extraction, we use 50%. This is also based on his recommendation. Uh, this is based on the suggested value uh, used in Jan Kupli's examples. Okay? Now, your flooding correlation diagram, unlike the gas absorption process, will not anymore be different if you're using, let's say, a structured packing material or a random packing material. You just have one flooding correlation uh, diagram. So in here, you have the you have this one, the abscissa, the ordinate of the abscissa, and this, and this one is for your ordinate, the x, the y coordinate. Now, in here, we, this particular curve is already fixed. There's no need for you to determine a particular value for this because there's only one in here, in your flooding uh, correlation diagram. So what we do here, we determine all of this. Uh, determine the density of the continuous phase. Uh, most of the time, this is given in the problem together with the density of the dispersed phase. Then the problem will also give us the interfacial tension. If the interfacial tension sigma is not given class, there's a formula that is used in determining this one. Uh, this one is the viscosity of the continuous phase, the mu sub c. This A is the surface area taken from the table together with the void fraction, the E here, the epsilon. They will be taken from a particular table which I'm going to show to you in the next slide. So upon, uh, after you have computed for this value, you just look for it in here on the vertical axis, then project it on this curve. Then uh, to the point that uh, that particular projection reach, you read the corresponding value of this. Now from your abscissa value here, from the projection of the point equivalent to this in your ordinate, uh, you'll be getting uh, V sub C and V sub D equation. An equation which has two unknowns, the V sub C and the V sub D. These are said to be, as defined, the superficial velocity of the continuous and the dispersed phases. So since you have two unknowns, you, have, you, have, you need another equation for you to be able one, uh, rather each one of this. So that particular equation is the ratio of the continuous and the dispersed phases as ratio of their flow rates as given in the problem. So the problem will give you the flow rates of the continuous and the dispersed phases. So you just take the ratio of that. So you have already the relationship between V sub C and V sub D. You use it together with the value that you have here from this equation and you, you'll now be able to determine the velocity, the superficial velocity at flooding. 
Okay? That particular superficial velocity at flooding, you will use together with the flow rate. The flow rate of the take note class, the continuous phase, your feed. So it is the feed flow rate that you are using in determining the condition when your column will be flooded. So your, your V sub C, the V sub C that you have will be divided by the computed 50% uh, of the uh, superficial velocity at flooding. Okay? And then, of course, you'll be able to determine the size of your column after that. As to the table where you're going to get the void fraction, this is the table uh, taken from Jan please. but you have one specific comprehensive table as I've mentioned already in your handbook. So you have the void fraction here and you have the corresponding packing materials here. And next to the column of the void fraction, you have the surface area A. Okay, so you... Uh, use the column appropriate for the set of units that is given in the problem. So here you have the feet squared per cubic foot. In here you have meter squared per cubic meter. Per unit volume, this is the surface area per unit volume of packing material used. Okay, this is where you're going to get the A and this is where you're going to get the void fraction. Now, as for the performance parameters of our extraction towers, remember you, you can determine the superficial uh, velocities for the dispersed and the continuous phases. You will know whether there's a way of validating whether the value that you're able to solve is acceptable for, a part for that particular column that the problem gave you. Because in here, if you're going to add, you can see here, the first column, if you're going to add the combined capacity of the streams, referring to the continuous phase, your feed and your solvent phase or the dispersed phase, if you're going to add the two, the value of their superficial velocity should not be less than or greater than the range that is given here. So you have one for spray tower, you have one for pack tower, you have one here for structured packing tower. So this is specific. A structured packing tower is a packing pack tower which uses structured packing materials. And so on and so forth here. You have sieve tray towers, the pulse pack tower, the pulse sieve tray tower, or the shibule tower. All of this, I will discuss. A majority of what you have here will be discussed in the succeeding slides because these are the types of the different types of extraction equipment. So these are their maximum combined allowable capacity for the flow rates of the dispersed and continuous phases. Now, what's the relevance of this table? Look for this as well in your handbook. You have one for this. The relevance is here in the HETS. Uh, if, we, if you recall me saying a while ago, in the case of liquid-liquid extraction, Unlike gas absorption and stripping, you don't determine the HETP anymore. In uh, the HETS anymore, because in gas absorption you determine the HETP. It's equivalent there. So in here, the HETS is computed. For example, for the spray tower, the HETS that you will use will be the average of the two values here on the range the HETS that you will substitute in the formula in determining the height of your column. So you have 3 plus 6, that would be 9 divided by 2, so that would be 4.5 in the case of the spray tower. This 4.5 HETS should be multiplied to the theoretical number of stages, just like the HETP being multiplied to N the theoretical number of stages in gas absorption. It's, it's the same thing here. You just change the HETP to HETS. Then you will be getting the height of your extraction column. Okay, so you have the other values here for the other towers. So far in here, in terms of the range of values, the highest is on the HET, uh, spray tower HETS because others are just very small compared to this range, 3 to 6 meters. 
for spray tower. The others are only as much as 1.6 meters, the highest in the range. Okay, you take the average of the HETS here, the same thing with uh, the one that you're going to refer to in your handbook. You get the average of the HETS and multiply it with the theoretical number of stages. In here, you also determine the theoretical number of stages for multi-stage extraction processes. And you will have, of course, a particular equation to use uh, for it. It can be both determined, uh, the theoretical number of stages can be both determined using graphical or analytical approach. So we'll uh, use the analytical without, of course, having to totally forget the essence of knowing the graphical approach. Okay, so you will be using this one, this table, and this table, and this diagram in designing your extraction column, okay, whether it's a packed column, a tray column, or any of the columns that I mentioned in here. Okay, so before we go to the sample problem, uh, by the way, the D in here is again an assignment, so it will be placed specifically in Canvas as an assignment which will be done individually, but of course, you'll do that after we're done discussing the solution to this problem here. Okay, we'll have a 10-minute break. After 10 minutes, you will solve the solution to this uh, problem. That is if you don't have any more questions. Do you have any questions? Yes. Okay, so we'll have a 10-minute break, then we'll go straight to the solution of this problem. So for our sample problem number four, we're given here toluene as our dispersed phase. So toluene is organic and this is our solvent. And it is being used to extract diethylamine from a dilute water solution as the continuous phase in a packed tower using one inch pal wings at 26.7 degrees Celsius. So your solute here is diethylamine and your carrier solvent in the feed is the is water. Now the flow rate of the toluene, your solvent, is 84 cubic feet per hour, and that of the water solution that, that is referring to your feed is 56 cubic feet per hour. Now the physical properties of the dilute solutions are as follows. So for your continuous phase, this is its density, considering that it has more water, so its density is comparable to that of pure water, which is 62.4. So in this case, it's 62.2 pound mass per cubic feet. Its viscosity is 2.080 pound mass per hour per foot. And for the dispersed phase, this is our density, uh, 54 pound mass per cubic feet. And the problem gave us also the interfacial tension in dyne per centimeter, which is 25. I have mentioned that whenever the problem does not give us the interfacial tension, we can still determine it using the empirical formula, which will be shared to you after this sample problem. So for letter A, you are to predict the flooding velocity. Letter B, using 50% of the flooding velocity, determine the tower diameter. And in letter C, uh, given that you have five theoretical stages, so since uh, determination of theoretical stages is still under the topic of multiple extraction processes, so in here you're just given a scenario. Let's say that the theoretical number of stages is five. You are to determine the tower height. Now, this problem already allows you to design your, uh, your column, your equipment, uh, size and uh, how tall it is, so diameter and height of the column. Now, this D is your assignment, as I have mentioned, and it will be written in Canvas. You'll be given a particular uh, item there in Canvas where you can do the submission for this one. Okay, so let's go back to our Jamboard. Uh, please take a screenshot of the problem that way uh, you'll have... Uh, to be able to contribute as to writing down the given information for this problem.
Okay, then we go to our jump board and solve the unknowns. Determine the unknowns for this particular problem. So this would be our sample problem number four already under extraction. So we are now on the sign, on the design of our specific extraction equipment. The first three are concerning only material balances. And so our given, so in here we'll draw our column. So this is where our feed is and our solvent. Okay, now our solvent is introduced at the bottom. Oftentimes, it's the dispersed phase, so it's introduced at the bottom. And our continuous phase, the feed is introduced on top. So in this case, we will place our solvent here. So this is our B. Uh, let's say I'll just label this as B sub uh, 2. This is our B sub 1. Although class, this is not uh, referring only to a single stage uh, column, huh? because in this case, we have five theoretical stages. So we'll just label it, by the way, based on the... representation of John Cooley. So if this is where your solvent is entering, so this must be P sub N plus 1. Okay, because this must be N stage and this is your V1. So this is your LO and this is your LN. So in terms of uh, multi-stage extraction, uh, equipment representation. In this case, the problem in C specify that you will have N equal to 5. So that is why I use this representation already. You're given a condition in C that your theoretical number of stages is 5. Okay, now we're going to write down our information, added information. So in terms of packing material, what is our packing material? What's the packing material used? It's important because you need that in uh, determining the void fraction and the surface area per unit volume of packing material. So what's our packing material? I ask you to take a screenshot of our problem. Your packing material is? So no one bothered to take a screenshot of the problem. Our packing material is one inch pal rings. Okay, that's our packing material. Now your column is operated at 26.7 degrees Celsius. What's the flow rate of our solvent? Our dispersed phase, the toluene, what's the flow rate? Fifty-four palmosmos. So it's uh, fifty-four cubic feet. So this is volumetric flow rate per hour. Now for our feed, what's the volumetric flow rate of the water solution? The feed that's. 56 cubic feet per hour. Okay, that's our feed. And then you're given the different properties that are very important in determining the uh, ordinate for our, in our flood correlation, flooding correlation diagram. So you're given the density of the continuous phase which is 62.2 pound mass per cubic feet. That for the dispersed phase, your solvent toluene is, uh, what is its density? 
Miss, excuse me, Miss. 84, galit Miss ang sa imbis 54. Okay, so 54 pound mass here per cubic feet. This one is 84. So you have the densities already. Then let's have the viscosity. So the original value for the viscosity is centipois. And it was already converted to 2.080 pound mass per feet per hour. Oh wait, it's pound mass per, yeah, correct, pound mass per foot per hour. So the corresponding derivation for uh, the unit of centipois for viscosity to this unit because our problem is using English units will be shared to you in the next slide in our PowerPoint presentation. So I just use mainly the direct value to save us time. So you already have the viscosity of the continuous phase and of course we're given the interfacial tension which is 25 dyne per centimeter. Okay, the interfacial tension between our solvent and our feed phases. So for letter A, as for our required information, you are asked for the prediction of the flooding velocity. So in here, you will have two answers. So flooding velocity, or flooding velocities, uh, referring to the superficial flooding velocities of the continuous phase and the dispersed phase, the V sub D. Letter B, you required for the diameter at 50% flooding conditions. And letter C, using the theoretical number of stages here, which is five, you are to determine the tower height. Okay, D will be your assignment. Okay. Uh, anything that you'd like to add as to the information that is stated in the problem, your toluene is used to extract the ethyl amine from a dilute water solution in a packed tower using 1 inch pile rings. The tower operated at 26.7 degrees Celsius. The flow rates for the dispersed and continuous phases are 84 and 56 cubic feet per hour, respectively. And here on the left side, you have the uh, properties of your uh, phases. So you have 62.2 pound mass per cubic feet for the continuous phase. Density, 54 for that of the dispersed phase. You have here your viscosity. You have here the interfacial tension. And you have, uh, what else? And these are your required information. Now we go to the solution. If we are to determine the condition when your column is flooded, I'd like to go back to our PowerPoint presentation. You need the this one. I, can you see the flooding correlation diagram? Yes, miss. Okay. So you'll be able to see this one, your ordinate. So all of this you need to, uh, not all, you need to compute this one. That way you'll be able to find the abscissa. So this will be our formula. We need the sigma divided by the density of the continuous phase raised to 0.2 multiplied to the ratio of u sub c over delta rho. By the way, this delta rho class is absolute. So it could be whichever of the two is greater. So it's an absolute difference in the density of the two phases. Then the A and the epsilon, which we need to get from the table, the ratio of A to E, uh, surface area to void fraction, the ratio of these two raised to 1.5.
Okay, so this formula, we will write here that we will be guided what we need to determine. So as for the ordinate of that particular diagram, we have rho divided by rho c. We raise it to 0.2. And you have here u sub c delta rho. And we have surface area per unit volume of packing material and the void fraction raised to 1.5. This one you need to know. So this, this, dense, this uh, interfacial tension, this density, this viscosity, this change or difference rather in the density of the two phases are all given in the problem. So we need only to look, to look up uh, in terms of A, we need to get this from the table, and the void fraction. So your, the information that you need for A and the void fraction is the type of packing material that is being used. So this is the first question I ask in terms of the given information. You have one inch pal rings. So you are to use that information in finding the A and the epsilon. So if you go back to our PowerPoint again, your A, can you please take note, for one inch pal rings, you have your pal rings, one inch nominal size. Your void fraction is 0 0.94 and your surface area will use the English unit is 63. So 63 and 0.94, 4 A and epsilon respectively, 63 and 0.94. So your void fraction here is 0 0.94. And this is 63. And you can now substitute in this formula. And by the way, this sigma, which is 25 dyne per centimeter, has to be converted in English units. So it has to be multiplied to uh, 28,572 pound mass. Per hour squared. This is the equivalent of one dime per centimeter. Okay, to convert the unit of your interfacial tension to English units. So your sigma then is seven hundred fourteen thousand three hundred pound mass per hour squared. So when we substitute here on the formula for the ordinate, we will just uh, use the values, will not anymore reflect the unit. So for sigma, you have 714,300. We divide it by rho sub c for the continuous phase. That's for your water. That's 62.2. We raise this to 0.2. And for mu sub c, 2.080. And for the difference in density, that would be 62.2 minus 54. And for the A, we have 63 and we have here 0.94. Now we're ready to determine our value for the ordinate. So this is, by the way, this is to be raised to 1.5. So the value for this is 902.8. Now this 902.8 for the ordinate, to give you. Yeah. So 902.8. Okay. So this is for the ordinate. If you go back, if you go back to our slide. So 
So we have 902. So this is your 1,000. This is your 700, 800, 900. So you project it here. Somewhere like here. Somewhere there. And then you read the corresponding value here below. So this is more or less, more or less, your abscissa is 170. Okay? From here, 170. And then we equate that to this particular formula. So take note, your V sub C and your V sub D are all raised to 0.5 when added. The sum is raised to 2. And you're multiplying it with rho C divided by A mu C. Okay, that's our formula. So I'll clear my markings here. Let's go back to our jump board. So with that, we'll have the 170 equated to the formula for our abscissa. So B sub C raised to 0.5. B sub D raised to 0.5. The sum of this raised to 2 multiplied to rho sub, C, rho sub C. Then we have A mu sub C. In this case, we have B sub C raised to 0.5 plus B sub D raised to 0.5. This is to be squared. Your rho sub C is 62.2. Your A is 63. Your mu sub C is 2.080. Okay, 63 over 2.080. You will have here this one. A B sub C raised to 0.5 plus a B sub D raised to 0.5 equal to. So 170 times 63. Let me see. 170 times 63 times 2.080 divided by 62.2 and you take the square root of that. One seventy times sixty-three times two point zero eighty divided by sixty-two point two and then take the square root of the answer. The answer for this is 18.92. And this is what I mentioned a while ago that we have two unknowns. So we're going to use the ratio of the flow rates of the continuous and dispersed phases as given in the problem. So you have this. This is your dispersed phase and this is your continuous phase. 54, uh, 84 and 56. So we'll have here V sub C over V sub D. So your continuous phase is 56, this is 84. So we can have here V sub C equal to 2 thirds. That would be 0.667 of V sub D. Equation two. If you do, if you use these two equations, solve for the unknowns B sub C and B sub D. This will be your B sub C and B sub D. One o eight point forty five. So feet per hour. And B sub C is 72. Point 0.30 feet per hour. This is already the answer for the letter A. Predict the flooding velocities. So these are your flooding velocities. Flooding velocities. Okay, next would be using 50% of the flooding velocity. Let me just check. Okay. Using 50% of the flooding velocity, you are to determine the 
diameter of your column. So you just need to multiply this by 50, the same thing with this one. So at 50% flooding, your V sub C will be 36.15 feet per hour and V sub D Fifty four point twenty three feet per hour. Okay, now if you take the sum of these two, let's see thirty six point fifteen, that would be ninety point three seven five feet per hour. Uh, th by the way, this is a packing column. So you can validate this value. You can validate this value on the V sub C and V sub D uh, velocities that are found in a particular table if, it's this, if this is acceptable. Okay, this is feet per hour. So let's go to the table, 90.375 feet per, per hour. In our table... We have a packed tower, right? However, this one is in combined capacity in meters per hour. So we need to convert the 90.375. We can, uh, this is in feet, we convert to meters. So if you divide that by 3.28, in terms of meters, it's 27.55. So please write it down. 27.55 meters per hour. So this is within the range that I'm showing to you in here. For pack tower, for pack tower, you have it at uh, 12 to 30. 12 to 30 meters per hour so in our case it's 27.55 so it's acceptable okay so that's the use of this one and you can get the HETS here already so you have 1.5 as the uh, biggest value on the range so 0 0.4 to 1.5 for the HETS uh, kindly write that down because we need it for the determination of the tower height. Okay? So in here, our answer is 27.55. If we convert the 90, so it's acceptable. Do you get it? Now we go back to what we're uh, uh, working on. So this is 90.3. 75 in meters, which is 27.55. So, meter, meters per hour. So, we're okay with this. The value that we're getting is acceptable. Now, in terms of the diameter, you use this one, the 50% only, feet per hour, together with the volumetric flow rate of the continuous phase. The volumetric flow rate of the continuous phase. So we'll have area is equal to the volumetric flow rate of the continuous phase, which is L sub O divided by V sub C. So this is 56 cubic feet per hour divided by 50% of the uh, superficial velocity of the continuous phase at flooding. And that's your 36.15 feet per hour. So in here, you'll be getting an area of 1.549 square feet. Now, diameter then, using pi d squared over 4, is equal to 1.404 feet. Okay, this is for letter D. You get it? So you use the feet 
the flow rate of the feed to determine the cross-sectional area of your column. Okay, together with the 50% of the computed uh, maximum superficial velocity also of the continuous phase. So for letter C, Z is equal to the theoretical number of stages times HETS. Our N, as stated in the problem, is 5. Our HETS is 0.4, right? Plus 1.5, the range that I asked you to write down in the table. For packed tower, we divide it by 2. So this one is equal to 0.45, oh sorry, 1.9 divided by 2 times 5. So that would be 4.75. Okay, 4.75, this is in meter, meters. Now, but this is not yet the true height of your extraction column. Now, you need to have allowances for the settling zones. Uh, two feet for the settling zones and the inlet nozzles. So, the original... 4.75 meter, you need to add 2 feet each. So 2, 2 feet. So that would be 4 feet. So you will have here plus 2 feet for the inlet nozzles, another 2 feet for the settling zones. And since this one is in meter, you need to convert this in feet. So you multiply it by 3.28. So this is 15.58 feet. So all in all, your Z, so you have to add here plus 4, is 19. 19.58 feet. So this is how high your extraction column would be for this particular problem that we have. Okay? Following as the solvent, and your feed is a mixture of diethylamine and water. Do you have any questions so far? Here? Any part of the solution that you might have any questions? So if you notice, as just like I have mentioned, it's really procedural. Just like the way we determine the size of our gas absorber or our stripper, it's also procedural. You just need to remember the steps and make sure that your units agree. Any questions? None, yes. Okay, we'll just uh, 